it's me again. Uh, that's Carl Monaghan um, from the Pelvic Pain Clinic and from Pelvic Pain Matters and from the Global Pelvic Pain Support Group recently set up for men. Um, if you're interested in joining the next support group taking place on Friday the 28th of June, do drop me an email. Um, I'll send you details of how you can join that as well as a, a brief introductory video. All right, so we are now on episode 38 of the Pelvic Pain Natters podcast. These are my Friday takeaways. Uh, these are reflections and um, bits of information to help you in navigating your recovery from pelvic pain. Now, last week I did a podcast on why I feel like pelvic floor dysfunction is a little bit like lab-born meat. A bit controversial, maybe, <laughs> maybe to your taste, maybe not to your taste. But what I'm doing here is I'm unpacking the pelvic floor um, and its role in pelvic pain. Um, so last week I described um, some of the things, some of the structures. Um, I described some of the functional changes that we're likely to see with pelvic floor dysfunction. Today we're going to start to put the pelvic floor back into the rest of the body and not leaving it just floating around in a, in a laboratory, not attached to anything else, uh, because that's not how the body works. Western medicine divides us up into, right, this is a musculoskeletal problem, this is a nervous system problem this is an immune problem this is a neurological problem might have said that one already that this is a psychological problem and this is a physical problem but it, we're not like that we are really complex beautifully orchestrated i'll come back to that in just a moment beautifully orchestrated beings that don't work in isolation of uh, of all of the integral systems within our body the muscles in our body are one instrument in a in the whole orchestra but that one single instrument is often the single instrument that is blamed for pelvic pain it's the muscles it's trigger points it's a fascial problem Fascia is the cling film like structure that uh, envelops muscles and nerves and organs. Um, and that's often blamed for the cause of pain as well. And so we need to do myofascial release, releasing the fascia and the muscles that will then stop the pain. But pain is more complex than that. Um, and it's one of the reasons why this condition is poorly understood and poorly treated is because we're either looking at infection um, or we're looking at as it only being a muscular problem. Well, I'm going to put, like I said, the muscles back into the body now. Um, but before we do so, I'm just going to take a very brief look at the anatomy of the nervous system. Um, and particularly the autonomic nervous system. Um so there are several branches of the nervous system, um, some of which we have control over, some of which uh, we don't. Um, imagine, for example, who is beating your heart right now? Is that you or your body? Who is digesting your food right now? Is that you, the individual, the character, or is that your body? Who is... Uh, um, who is coordinating the release of your pancreatic enzymes right now? Is that you or is that your body? What about breathing? Breathing is an interesting one, actually, and I love breathing. Um, <laughs> it really helps. Um, but breathing can either be voluntary or involuntary. So there are so many times throughout the daytime um, that your breathing is not under your conscious control. It is a subconscious controlled mechanism. But with mindfulness and with breath work, you can bring your breathing under your own control. And in fact, that's really, really helpful. Um, if you know me and my work, then you'll definitely understand my appreciation of breath work and calming things down. So there are some 
parts of the nervous system that that work for us um, that we have conscious control over and then there are some parts of it that we don't have conscious control over as well so the autonomic system can be divided into the sympathetic the parasympathetic and then the enteric nervous system um, so the enteric nervous system is like the oldest brain in our body more than the one up here in our noggin the enteric nervous system is the one that uh, is responsible for our digestive tract um, the other, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, you may know or have heard from different terms, fight and flight response, fight, flight, freeze. That was also another rehash of, of, of the stress response, but the stress response, um, is, uh, we all have it. It's really helpful. It's designed to, to keep us alive and alert, and without which um, we wouldn't be as successful a species as we currently are. <clears throat> but the sympathetic nervous system um, is sympathetic to the cause, and so it allows us to respond to the environment that we're in. Um, it controls it, it's sorry it, it it helps to release things like cortisol or adrenaline some of the stress hormones some of those that you might have heard of um it, it can be a wound up um so when when we are in that sympathetic response our systems are wound up we feel on edge we might feel anxious we might feel that well, there's extra muscular tightness going on Ooh, a bit of a clue here um it might feel that our heart rate is higher it, we might feel clammy and sweaty um, our pupils will likely be dilated as well we may not be digesting we may not be feeling very hungry um, now pelvic pain can lead to a stress response in fact the condition itself is is incredibly stressful and there's this constant feedback loop between the brain and the rest of the body it's not in isolation we don't have brain over here in a formaldehyde jar um, if you know what Futurama is, it's a cartoon from the 90s and noughties where there were several characters that had their heads in formaldehyde jars separate from the rest of their bodies. Our bodies are not like that. They are fully integrated, a beautiful orchestra. Do you remember that? Um, and so we get this constant feedback and feed forward loop from our brains to our bodies and and the external world and i need to do an upcoming podcast on this i might grab tim to do this um on on a much bigger model of of how the environment that we're in really does influence our body surprise surprise um for better and or for worse and messaging that we hear things that we read things that uh, we are told um, they can all contribute to our systems being wound up or relaxed so when we're in this sympathetic fight and flight response, it can become the norm, especially if we're in there most of the time. We're not in there all of the time, but we can be in there a vast majority of the time. And that can lead to normal new behaviors. Sorry, it can lead to new behaviors becoming the norm. It becomes, it can be uh, like a habitual response where something we started off by doing consciously, I'm gonna clench up and protect my pelvic floor now, how's that happening? Is it just doing it by itself? Is the pelvic floor rogue? Has it gone a wall on us? It has not. It absolutely has not. The nerves that exit your spinal cord enter into your pelvic region in, and they innovate the muscles and they are part of the signaling system that encourages muscles to tighten up or to relax. Muscles don't do that by themselves. They are driven centrally by your nervous system. Please, please, please be aware of this. If we only look at the muscles in pelvic floor dysfunction, you are missing out on so many opportunities for recovery. When we understand that our nervous systems can be wound up and I'm wound up for long sustained periods of time where maybe that new tight pelvic floor just becomes the norm for us. Maybe that just becomes part of our makeup that we are wound up in our pelvic floor especially. And then that will contribute, listen to my words, not cause, but contribute to pelvic floor dysfunction, if that's the term that you wish to use for what's going on. All right, so this new norm, this new wound up state of, of alertness in the pelvic floor will naturally change our ability to uh, have bowel movements in some cases, what that might look like for our urinary function in some cases, as well as our sexual function. 
as well as comfort and tension and tightness and soreness and fatigue and heaviness and dragginess and all of those feelings that can often happen in and around the pelvis. Um, it's important to look beyond the muscles. So the other side of the sympathetic response is the parasympathetic response, which is has been termed rest and digest. It happens when we are away from a stressful situation or when we've overcome the condition or when we are resting or when we feel at peace or at ease in the environment that we're in, maybe the people that we're with as well. This is a down regulation of the nervous system and this helps muscles to soften and to relax and to yield and to let go. So, Although we might use things like the wand, the pelvic floor wand and trigger point therapy and massage, and I've done all of these things and I've taught all of these things. I've been a hands-on practitioner uh, therapist now for 24 years, I think it's been. So I know these things intimately. Um, and I've used all of these tools and techniques to help to relax the pelvic floor through manual therapy. But what I realize is that I need to work a little bit higher up the chain of command. If I'm going to really get this to settle into and the system and to become a new, better norm, I can't massage someone's stress away. I can help. I can't trigger point someone's anxiety away. It might support it, but I need to look at much more innovative techniques that work on the central nervous system, on calming us down centrally. And if we start to do that and we work on this parasympathetic response, you may have heard of the vagal nerve, vagal nerve stimulation. The vagal nerve is one of the cranial nerves that runs all the way down into our abdomen and our thorax and innovates our digestive system, for example, and many of the organs in there. The aim is to calm down all of the nerves in the body, not just the pudendal nerve or the vagal nerve um, or the ilioinguinal nerve or the posterior tibial nerve. Again, nerves don't work in isolation. They are part of the orchestra. Look at the bigger picture, see the bigger picture, and you're going to have so many more opportunities for recovery. Pelvic floor dysfunction is not about muscles. Pelvic floor dysfunction should always include how we look at the nervous system. And if you do, then you're opening yourselves up for many, many more opportunities in recovery. If we solely look at the muscles in pelvic floor dysfunction, it's like looking at the tip of the iceberg and not seeing the bigger picture, not seeing all of the things that are influencing why we can see that bit at the top behaving in the way that it does. So here is another Friday takeaway. This is episode 38 of Pelvic Pain Natters, and this is Carl Monaghan, and this is my Friday takeaway. Thank you very much for those of you who answered the questions that I posed around um, why the pelvic floor, why we should look beyond the pelvic floor. Just a nod to some of you and to some of the answers that you gave. That's much, much appreciated. Um, yeah, it's great. And thank you very much for working with me. Um, some of the responses include strength training, um, weakness in the core and the glutes. Some of them talk about our behaviours and our habits and where we are in our world. They might talk about the anxiety and the worry and the concern that we have. But it's always important to look beyond the muscles. The muscles are the first things that we see or touch or move or press or stretch, but they are not the answer. Let's open up. Not literally, don't open ourselves up literally. That's all kinds of problems. That's going to be way, way worse than your pelvic pain. But let's open up the concept and the idea that that recovery is about looking at the individual, the patient, the human, you, the listener, as an integrated model, as an orchestra. And then we're far more likely to get better results. Uh, okay, so that's been another episode on pelvic floor dysfunction. I'm going to continue this. You're going to get a little bit more around pelvic floor dysfunction and things that you can do to help this as well. It's a Friday takeaway. Enjoy.